Good day, Mount Vernon. This is Jack Parker, your superintendent, starting a new video series with you today. And we're going to kick it off with the esteemed Deb Thomas, the wonderful social studies teacher for Mount Vernon Middle School. And uh, to start the series, I want to talk a little bit about our belief to balance structure and nurture. And that's so important. And even our belief states when we approach students with a balance of nurture and structure, our correction is highly impactful. So I want to ask you, tell me a little bit about what you do in a classroom to make sure you have high structure and high nurture. Absolutely. I think that high nurture in the classroom means that students have a safe, enjoyable, and engaging place in which to learn. And it means that you are minimizing disruptions so that students can focus on learning. And from a teacher standpoint, it's very important because you may have designed the best lesson plan in the world, but you'll have trouble implementing it if you have inadequate classroom management. Mm -hmm. And I think creating a calm, orderly environment today is especially important because we have so many students coming to us with heightened stress responses mm. because of emotional challenges and trauma, and they can be triggered very easily in an unstructured environment. Now, a nurturing environment means that you have a classroom where you are offering care and connection to your students. And if you're connecting with your students and you're building relationships with them and you're meeting their needs, then you're building trust. So ideally in the classroom, you want there to be high structure and high nurture because high structure is promoting growth and high nurture is promoting trust. Oh, I love that. Give me an example of, of some of the techniques you use for high structure in your classroom. I think that high structure begins with expectations. Okay. And I think that starts immediately. Students have to know what they're expected to do and how they're expected to do it. And I think that leads to a discussion of classroom rules and procedures. And that has to happen on day one. Mm -hmm. I think that sets the tone for the rest of the year. And so I try to be very specific with my students. When I discuss a misbehavior, I talk about what is acceptable, what's not acceptable, as well as consequences. Okay. Mm -hmm. For example, my students know that I expect them to come to class on time and be seated by the time the bell rings. If not, that constitutes a tardy. Three tardies, if they accumulate that, will mean a detention. So I think being very clear with your rules and procedures, and then later revisiting those throughout mm -hmm. the year so that students can get reminders, uh, as well as uh, clarifying any misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. And I think it helps too to post your rules and procedures yep. and so that students can have those visual reminders. And I think routines are incredibly important too. I think routines set the rhythm of your classroom. I think that students have to have a relatively clear idea of what to expect when they enter your classroom. My students know that when they come into my room, they're to be seated, silent, and working on the bell ringer. That requires them to get engaged in the learning, and it gives me time to take attendance mm. and check makeup work. I also like to post my daily assignments, my okay. learning objectives uh, on the board, so it gives them a roadmap of what to expect. And I find that when we stick to those routines, I'm, I'm building trust because mm -hmm. they know what to expect and it eases any anxiety and concerns they may have about the class that day. Mm -hmm. I bet you're very consistent as well, right? I try to be. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, things I happen. Let, let's talk just a little bit about um, what are some of the things you do in class because you have high expectations, um, and we know that students will meet those expectations if you have a good relationship with them mm -hmm. and, you, and you have that nurture side. So mm -hmm. what are some of your tips for folks to make uh, great relationships with your kids? I think that this speaks a lot to the nurturing environment. And I think that a nurturing environment is very supportive because you're there to help meet students' needs. You're there to help them self-regulate. And so we've learned a lot of great strategies through our TBRI training sessions and mm -hmm. consultations. I think one of the most helpful things that I do is I have a check-in with my struggling students and they tell me right away where they are on, on the learning continuum. Oh. Are they ready to go? 
or not as much or somewhere in the middle and then from there I can help them. Um, if they're ready to go then we're off and running. If they are not then I can try to help them get regulated and they may need a little break, they may need some water, a snack, um, deep breathing exercises help tremendously. So those are all strategies that have been tremendously helpful and when you are using those strategies you're, you're building connections because they're trusting you to walk through difficult situations. Mm. And I also have found that positivity is a great way to establish connection. Students really need to take pride in their behavior and their academic successes. And when you celebrate those, you're, you're positively reinforcing those, those things that you want to continue to see happening in the classroom. Like and there it. are so many ways to be positive with your students. Yeah. Verbal praise, um, just greeting them, asking them about their day, uh, sending them positive notes home or putting positive comments on report cards. Possibilities are endless, but at the end of the day, positivity really does build connection with your students. Mm, I love that. It also reminds me of the principle that you raise what you praise. So mm -hmm. if you want to see more of a behavior, you praise it. So I, I love that. So you mentioned TBRI just a moment ago. Yes. Um, tell me, what are some of the things that you've learned in the last couple of years since you've had that trauma-informed approach? Something that is um, newer that you may not have done a few years ago. I think it really opened my eyes to the level of trauma that so many of our students are coming to us with. Uh, and it's, it's helped me to try to look at the big picture. So if a student has an outburst in class, the outburst is a symptom of a bigger mm -hmm. underlying problem or need. And if you can try to meet that need, hopefully you can get that behavior to diminish. Mm, wonderful. Well, very good. Um, gosh, you've been a wealth of information already. Before we wrap things up, is there anything else you'd like to share? I think that one of the most important things I've also learned is that high structure and high nurture do work well together. Because if, if we don't have high structure, then we may not be holding our students accountable. And if we don't have high nurture, then we're not meeting their needs. And if we're not doing both of those things at the same time, then we're not helping our students become responsible, functioning individuals. Well, Deb, thank you so much for spending time with me today. So. Um, it means a lot to me, and I'm sure it means a lot to all the folks watching the video. Hope you have a great day. Thank you.